Hey, welcome to the best of everything. I am Ruben Paul. And uh, as usual, I'm joined by my partner in crime, uh, the one and only uh, Portuguese assassin who's uh, Mexican during the quarantine. <laughs> the Portuguese any other time. Uh, Mr. Johnny Sanchez, how you doing, brother? I am loving that Portuguese assassin, dude. Yeah. 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 Good today, Johnny. I'm in a good mood. Yeah, dude. I like it's, that. It's you, though. That's not why I'm in a good mood. It has nothing to do with you. What do you mean? The reason why I'm in a good mood is we have a very special guest oh. today. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a funny thing. We haven't spoken in a week. You'd think he'd be excited to even see me in this quarantine, but... Uh, continue, continue. I'm excited. You're, well. you're clean shaven. You look good, man. You you oh, look good. Oh, I shaved like two days ago. Wow. So wow. All right. So you're really Mexican uh, now, because I couldn't even tell. Now you're getting darker and everything. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, where are we? Are we live? Wait, I can't find it. Yeah, we're live. So so post it to your Facebook page. But let me introduce our special yes. guest. Yes. Um, we have a very special guest. Um, this guy, I can't remember exactly when we met, I know around the, the time, but, uh, he's an outstanding, uh, director. He's directed comedy specials for some of the, the biggest acts in comedy. Uh, he's a lover of comedy and, um, I'm excited to have him on the show. We'll talk about his journey, um, and what, what he's doing now, but ladies and gentlemen, give it up for director, producer, uh, he's been a driver. He's been a PA assistant. He's done it all in this business. The one and only Mr. Dave Higby. Hey. hey, Dave, how are you, brother? Good, good, man. What's happening? Man, uh, we're excited to have you. Um, we, of course, we, we've had Russell on. We had Ralph Harris on. And, um, you know, I just thought, you know, when I was thinking of, like, who the next guest could be is to get a different perspective in comedy because you actually direct comedy specials and it's always interesting uh that collaboration between the artist and the director especially in a medium like comedy you know what i mean it's not like you're yep, going yep. off of a script you know you're going off of somebody's passion what they feel in their heart their material and just trying to capture it the best way for the audience to see it so and i think you do a great job in doing that i think we oh, really I can't remember. Here's what I remember about you, Higgs. I know <laughs> we, we worked together uh, with Russell on a few specials, but I think the time we really connected and had like a conversation was the special that we shot in Toronto. Yeah, yeah. And then you were also, you opened for him in Sydney when we shot Notorious. I remember you there. But for some reason, it didn't, it didn't seem like we had much. We talk and it was kind of like passing like, ship. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I just I remember Toronto. We just uh, yeah. a real, real relationship too. No, I definitely yeah. get in the zone when I'm, you know, yeah. in that in that place. But uh, I think we definitely had some time to catch up in, in Toronto. It's a more yeah. intimate setting too. We're kind of all jammed backstage at Massey Hall, those little cubby holes and shit there. Well, and, and of course, my ego. Maybe the conversation we had because I was walking around like, like, hey, man, when are you going to do a special? <laughs> yeah, when are we? we got to get that one going, man. Yeah, we definitely have to. Hey, Ruben, yeah. you got a little bit of uh, – Dave, you you hear him as well? Yeah, a, yeah a, it's, a like, it's like that pride of the Yankees with uh, Luke Garrigan's disease, and he's like, hello, hello. Oh, there's, there's, there's a little drag there going on with you. Um, it is a drag, yeah. Yeah. Let me see. So, I mean, I maybe. Okay, let me see if I can fix this. Hold on, let me. So you got a little distortion. There's a little, a little either distortion or feedback. Uh, and, and and I mean, obviously, Dave was able to figure out. Is that any better? It dials it, yeah, it dials it back a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Keep talking. Check, check. There we go. 
I think that's better, dude. Just just deal with your headphones. Check, check. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wait, sounds good. Sounds better. Can you hear the us? The problem is these headphones suck. Well, I mean. Okay. That's so only your Beats by Dre thing going, then you're fucked. So. But they, but they suck. They, the sound sucks for one person as a as opposed to the sound sucking for thousands of people. The problem is I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, at all? No, I'm I'm literally listening to you from just basically almost reading your lips. Oh shit! Yeah. <laughs> Hold on, let me see something. Maybe if I could change. Thanks, Rob. Rob said I sound good, but you know I've been I've been somehow, Dave. I've been I'm the least guy out of the two of us, and I seem to be having no no problems for some reason. Okay. <laughs> it's like beginner's luck or something. Yeah. Is that any better? Um, I mean, you gotta keep talking. Is yeah. this a <laughs> <laughs> is it echoing? Is He's it like, echoing? Is there an echo still? No. It's it's yeah. It's not so much an echo. Just there's there's just a little bit of a, a It's more of a little glitch while you're speaking, but I but I think it'll be fine. It's better than it was before. Yeah. Yeah, that's better. Okay. okay. Um. So let's uh, pick it back up. So so Dave. Yes, sir. Where. What was your first comedy special that you directed, or better yet, what led you into comedy? God, uh, taking you way back. I mean, I, you know, I've kind of came up in production management at MTV and VH1, and that was kind of a like a kind of crazy school for television production. A lot of people that came out of there, my peers, went on to do many big shows as producers and directors and that kind of stuff. Um, so from that world, I got into more production management, pushing paper, and that kind of stuff. And um, in the process of babysitting a lot of edits, while well, the show would go into post production and you'd kind of sit in there for days, you'd see how these multi shows come together. And then um, I was working for me music, doing a lot of. Um, just kind of production management on concerts and Disney Channel concerts and specials. And um, at some point, somebody, actually Alan Blomquist at Parallel Entertainment, who was doing Blue Collar at the time, they had um, they put together a deal with, with Warner Brothers and Comedy Central for a whole series of specials, straight to DVD and the 45 minute, you know, 45 minute hours. And uh, yeah, no. they said, they do you want to do comedy, comedy specials? specials. So, you know, like you know, one guy with a microphone on a stage was like shooting fish in a barrel. barrel. So it was like, like bring, it, bring on. it on. Yeah. I, I, I just have a quick question. When, when you were when you were working uh, with, with VH1, was mm -hmm. that at the time that they were, uh, were you also working with, um, I mean, obviously behind the scenes and everything of, of VH1's uh, Spotlight, the comedy? Oh, no, this was... It was just strictly their videos and all that other stuff. No, it was uh, like storytellers. There was an uh, award show called the VH1 Honors. That was like a big yeah. deal at the time. I remember those. Yeah, I remember um, those. Yeah. This was probably like the mid-90s. Yeah. Mid to late okay. 90s. Got it. Okay. Then, um, yeah, at Sony, we were doing stuff for like, God, what do we do? Jessica Simpson for the Disney Channel. Okay. 98 Degrees in Concert. Yeah, kind of like yeah, real highbrow stuff. <laughs> and uh, but you know, hey, it was a like I said, it's like a kind of a learning opportunity, and um, kind of got to figure out multi camera and how that all went together, and kind of coverage actually, and you know, where do you put the camera? How do you cover it? And you know, once we got down to like a comedian on a stage, that was kind of that was it, you know. And then um, piece of cake, yeah. As for the first one, it was Lisa Lampanelli's Dirty Girl. Mm. Okay. Yeah, we, shot that. we shot that in Seattle in, I don't know, 2005 or six or something like that. Sounds about right. Was that the one with the you know? No, that was um, 
Queen of Mean, actually, Long Live the Queen or Queen of Mean was her HBO special. Okay. This was a Comedy Central and went to, went to DVD as well. And, um, you know, they kind of sprung me on her. They, we showed up and uh, I ended up in the chair and Lisa was like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> Now, now, I'm getting some, some comments. They're saying now, are you hearing Dave in reverb at all, Johnny, when he's talking? Yeah, there was a, there was a couple of little moments, but it wasn't, it, it, it got back on, on track. So, okay. So, yeah, Rob was saying there's some reverb. I don't know what test means. I guess he was trying to say yes. So, so Dave, yeah. when they want you to, to do Lisa's special, you had never shot a comedy special before. What was that moment when, <laughs> like, did you say, uh, you're, yeah. You're in the chair, kid. I mean, I was, I, was, I was good with it. I mean, well, before that, okay, the first things we did at Parallel, before they let me direct anything, we produced Henry Cho, What's That Clicking Noise? We shot that mm -hmm. in Tennessee. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, we did, Two with Ralphie May. We did um, Girth of a Nation. Of a Nation. I love and that. Um, God, what was the other one? Uh, oh, Prime, Prime, Prime Cut. Cut. Prime Cut. And I'll tell you, he was the first guy that I've ever seen. He did two comedy specials in one night. We basically did like an eight o'clock show. He did a set, changed the curtain. He changed his wardrobe. He came back out. And in one night, we bagged two comedy specials. I've never seen anybody do that to this day. Wow, that's wow. impressive. That's <laughs> really, I mean, two, two completely different hours and he just fucking went for it, so. That's that's really impressive. Wow, that is wow. amazing. God bless him. Ralphie Bay. R.I.P. Ralphie, man. And you know what's interesting about that, Dave, is you know, here somebody like Ralphie did something as prolific as doing two specials in, in one night and I remember uh, the first time I went to the Montreal Comedy Festival, he was there and I'm like, yo, how many times is this for you? And he's like, this is my first time. I'm like, what? Wow. You've been comedy 20 years and this is your first time ever being invited to the Montreal Comedy Festival? So to you, all you comics out there, um, you can't let you know one entity validate your self-worth or your value. Right, you know, because right. even at that time when Ralphie came and did, and I think it was um, uh, Lonnie Love's first time there too, and these are people who have TV credits, et cetera, et cetera, and had never been, you know, invited, including myself. So, uh, wow, that's a great, that's impressive, man. That's that's really impressive. Like I said, I've never seen anybody. Usually, you do a second show. It's kind of a safety net, you know. It's like, yeah. okay, we didn't get it in the first show. We'll do the second show. Ralphie was like, "Fuck it, I'm doing two shows," and we got literally two specials out of one night. And uh, so that was was that Earth of a Nation and Prime Cut back to yep. in one night. I, I just I, I don't want to gloss over this <laughs> because I don't think people realize how insanely prolific that is to be able to do something like that. Because like Dave said, and, and Johnny knows this too, usually you, you do two and then you cut them together. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you cut uh, two shows together and the public sees one special and you can't tell whether the jokes are from the first show or the second show. Sometimes they're from, from both shows. Yeah. So somebody to take, to take a special and have one shot each with both hours is fucking insane, dude. Yeah. Wow. Listen, never seen, never seen anybody do it since. And, and I'm since. curious. I'm curious. Did he do, um, well over an hour on each one? This way he had room yeah back or yeah right. So that's think about that. He did probably two and a half hours of material. Um, oh, at least yeah. But, oh well, okay. You know, I mean, the DVDs we ran were probably seventy minutes. 70, 75 minutes. So he probably did 90 twice. That's three wow. hours in one night. Wow, 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 man. RIP Ralphie, man. That's yeah, that, man. that's impressive. That's wow. impressive. So, so then after that was Russell's outsourced in uh, San Francisco. Okay. What, well, that was what, like 2006 or something? Yeah, right in about that same time. Yeah, because I think I started working with Russell 
after that or met Russell shortly after that. Um, so, so Dave, where did your love for comedy come from? Did it come from just, okay, I'm directing specials now. Let me learn about comedy and immerse myself in comedy. Or had you always been a comedy fan? No, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, I kind of, I kind of came up in like the seventies. So it was like, yeah, the Cheech and Chong Big Bamboo album. You had like the Steve Martin kind of thing going on. Um, Richard Pryor. I remember before they actually had me, but they had me even direct anything. I was like, okay, what the fuck am I doing? And I went out and I looked at you know Pryor and the Sunset Strip, and I looked at you know how those were set up and like where the angles were and the cameras and you know, how it was cut together and really kind of studied some of the great specials to kind of get a vibe. Got you. Now, here, here's a, a question. Um, okay. So when you're, you know, like when you see certain movies and certain directors have like a signature style, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, what's like a uh, Michael Mann with the, you know, extreme close-ups and stuff like that. When you're, when you're directing a comedy, um, uh, a, a comedy special, is there anything that it's like a Dave Higby type shot mm -hmm. or something that you add to to the, the to the style of directing or you just base it on the artist and what you think serves the material best? I mean, I would say, and some people don't like it, but I use the jib arm over the shoulder kind of move, that mm -hmm. kind of reverse from behind the scenes. And it's usually like a short jib arm, maybe, 12 to 15 feet and it's kind of especially with somebody like Russell where he's doing a lot of crowd work and Lisa was doing the same yeah. you can mm -hmm. kind of come over the shoulder and you're catching that conversation from kind of like the behind Lisa's head going to the audience and you see that reaction shot and I feel that it ties the artist into the the broader space um, a lot of comedy specials are so frontal you'll just see close up, head to toe and all that. And then um, or something, yeah. Yeah, and then, you know, you'll pepper in an audience shot here or there to either cover a pull up or, you know, cut the show a little, cut the show down the time or something. But um, I find those reverse shots off the jib kind of really shows you the space. And I mean, a lot of the facilities that we were shooting in, whether it was the Tennessee theater or the, uh, Got to wherever we shot Russell in San Francisco. I mean, those are beautiful venues. And, you know, we had great lighting directors that really lit those spaces up. And so you really got to, you really want to see the architecture of these. I'm a big fan of the movie palaces and stuff from the old days that we shot it. And, and then with Russell stuff, when we got into arenas, it was like, holy shit, there's, you know, the O2 arena. And you want to see, you want to see that. Yeah. Johnny, do you have any? Well, that I, it's interesting because I was gonna, I, I was gonna ask him about specifically that because it seemed like there was a, um, you know, Ruben and I have had these conversations before, but back in the day, by obviously, seventies, eighties, so probably maybe even in the, the early mid nineties, it was a lot of the, you know, single, uh, you know, waste, uh, full shot, then three, you know, half shots and stuff like that. Every now and then, a cut to the uh, the audience. Uh, what I started to notice that was happening in somewhere around the mid 2000s, but like, oh, I felt like it was somewhere around 05 to about, oh, about the, to 2015 or in there. Um, I noticed that, you know, I'd be taping other, you know, little put together specials and things like that. And mm -hmm. a lot of times, what, what uh, Ruben and I started noticing that, and, and I happen to know some that directed them that specifically were saying, well, we want to, we got to, the attention span is is so so um, uh, fast nowadays. Nobody has attention span, so we've got to keep all these things happening while the comic is performing. And what started to happen was there was a lot, a lot more quick cuts. So you know, you see the guy going, "Hey, let me tell you guys something," and then you can hear him. And there's a cut to the audience, and there's another cut over here to the audience, and then the the, the jib of the, from from the while they're talking of, of the all the audience. And then some shots from behind, not the one where it's just, but just cut. Mm -hmm. And we, I know Ruben and I at the time, we were feeling like some of the material was getting lost because they're, you're not focused on the comic and where he's taking or she, he or she is taking you in their story. 
Um, and I remember hearing, uh, <laughs> I remember hearing one guy say, he's like, no, man, this is, I like it. I like it to keep, to move, 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 because, you know, it got, you got to keep their attention and, you know, I'd like to get some, you know, uh, directing awards. So it was sort of like, it was more about, let me, let me razzle dazzle basically with all of this. And I feel like now it's starting to come back as I'm looking at, you watch some of the Netflix spent the more recent ones. It does feel like they're kind of going back to the um, less of, of multi cuts all over the place and more of let, let the, the, the stand up uh, let his or her material and stories carry the, the special. Yeah, I mean, for me, I feel like comedy lives in the close up. I mean, they, you got to have that close up. You're there generally for the punchline, or if there's a physical gesture, maybe you're playing it, playing it in like a medium or something like that. Um, so you've got your 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 head to toe, your medium, and your close up, or your three principal cameras. You might have some cross shots coming in, um, like a floating jib. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing that me and Johnny talked about, and I, I think this is a very 90s thing, where the cutaway to the audience. Because, you know, when prior to those guys were doing it, the camera was on those guys probably 98% of the time. Yeah, like you, I was going to say 90, but 98 might even be more accurate. Yeah. Like you rarely saw the audience. And I just think with when stand up hit television, you know, all the stand up shows like a VH1 Comedy Spotlight, uh, even at the Improv, those type shows, they really incorporated the audience. And it's just to me sometimes it's like you're telling people when they should be laughing. Like, hey, these people are laughing, you should be laughing. Instead of really just focusing on the material and letting the material stand on it on its own. Uh, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like the audience helps, um, cutting away to the audience helps the m material? Is that why they're doing it? What do you think the, the logic behind it is? I mean, I, I'm not a fan of the cutting to the audience just to kind of force that laugh. And I think people have a right to feel that way. That you're, you're not dictating how they should laugh or what they should laugh about. Um, to me, to editorial, me editorial, it's like, like the, the comedy, comedy. For instance, a lot of special the camera, same thing. Ruffles out, out. Cameras were the same position with Dirty Girl. They were in the same position. And in theory, those specials should all look exactly the same. But the cadence and delivery of the comedian and their pace and how they delivered and that dictated the cuts and the whole pace and. So, so Ralphie, Ralphie has, has a completely has different feel than Russell has a different feel than Lisa, Lisa, all because, because of their comedic timing. timing. Mm -hmm. And the and comedic, comedic timing drives the edit for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, you're in the punchline, you're in the story, you get to the punchline, then you let it breathe, you show the wide shot, you kind of come around, you show the big space, you let it breathe, you kind of reset, and you come back to the next bit or the, the whole you know, situation. Uh, I'm uh, sorry to cut you off, Dave. They're saying the echo, echo effect again. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, oh, yeah. Trying to I'm think, trying to think of what we can do to help solve that. Is is everyone's, how, how's your volume on your actual, uh, on your mic? Are you, are you, are you speaking through the, the computer? I'm on a computer, but I've got, um, I've got the headphones the on. Because so it's hello, gone hello. now. I think it's better now. Yeah, it's gone okay. now. Um, so, so Dave, um, obviously, you know, being a director, you kind of found your niche in directing specials. Do you want to direct like, you know, acting like film and television? Is that an interest for you? Or you kind of like directing live events? I, I love the live events. It's something I've kind of gotten hooked on and brought into. Um, I would welcome any opportunity, you know, I mean, yeah. we're, you know, we like to work because but um, <laughs> especially now, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny because it, I was trying to get an agent a few years ago and I finally cut a reel and got it out to the, this guy over at uh, William Morris and he looked at it and he's like, well, that's, that's all you got. You know, I, you know, it's like, do you do, 
you do like drama? Do you do anything else? Well, no, these are, you know, yeah. there's 15 stand up specials all woven together for you. Just, what else you got, kid? Yeah. So. <laughs> well, isn't this better about this business, man? It's like as accomplished as you are and you found your niche and, and you're good at it, people still, you know, want you to do more. Like, you know, you never say that in really in any other occupation. Like somebody wouldn't be like, I'm a first baseman. It's like, hey, man, you you, you can't pitch. <laughs> you know, like, no, this is, uh, I play the infield, dude. That's, that's what I do. I don't know if that's the best example, but it's just, I, I just think the the fact that you've found a niche in 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 shooting live events for for television it, it's great. Now here's something: Would you want to direct like a concert film, and what would that? How would that process differ from shooting stuff for for television or for Netflix or something like that? Like a music thing, like like uh, like Kevin Hart shot his for to be released in theaters. Is that a oh, yeah. different? Is that a different way of shooting it? Or you just shoot it the same and release it in the same I way? Shoot it the same. I mean, that's more of a, just your post-production process, actually. You know, it's, you're delivering a, a master for theatrical projection or whatever. I mean, and, and these days with like the deliverables on a Netflix special, those could go right into a theater and be projected. I mean, they're beautiful 4K masters that they require and, um, I mean, I don't think I would cover it any differently, I, you know? Mm -hmm. So oh, we can all get back to a place where people can sit in a theater and groove on some comedy, you know? Sure. So, so, so looking through your IMDb, kind of uh, shifting uh, uh, directions, oh, uh, what life. Gilbert Grape? Yes. Yeah, I saw that. Tell me about that experience, because I love that movie, man. Yeah. And uh, that was one of the first films uh, I think Leonardo got attention for. I'll tell you, I mean, I only worked on pre-production and again, it was Alan Blomquist. He was the line producer who brought me into Parallel later, but um, he was kind of my mentor when I first came to LA and got me into some of these films. And um, so I worked on pre-production and we're out in this office in Santa Monica and um, Peter Hedges, the writer, Lucas Hedges, Lucas Hedges' dad is, was, finishing the script and they were kind of piecing the movie together and trying to figure out. Um, and the script in the book, there was never specific, like what's wrong with Arnie Grape? Like what's the ailment that makes the kid so special? And um, so we had consulted this doctor at UCLA and he basically sent over one of his patients this kid, Nicholas, who was kind of a little, uh, had an affectation, shall we say. And yes. DiCaprio spent the afternoon with him and they videotaped him and they kind of spent the day together. And DiCaprio basically absorbed this kid's persona. Mm. And that's essentially what you see on screen. I, re I remember they went off to Texas and they filmed the movie Actually, it's funny. We were in the office, and it's like a long hallway with some cubby holes where production was in, and a long bookcase. And the kid's like walking up and down the hall, and he comes in and he looks at me and the production coordinator, and he looks at us and down the hall. He looks back and he's like, 60 shells." We're like, "What? Like Sixty shells?" We, we, he walks away, away and we look down the hallway, and it's like fucking sixty shells on this bookcase that runs all the way down. So oh. the kid had that special gift of, you know, yeah, counting shelves or whatever. Yeah. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so they so they went off to like, like that was his brain man moment. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was completely like, wow, this kid is, you know, can barely function, but yet he's got something on a deeper level that he's got it. But then they wow. went off to Texas and filmed the movie. And when I saw it, it was like DiCaprio had become that kid. Like there was every gesture, every mannerism, the vocal inflections. Wow. Everything was, yeah. and that's the genius of DiCaprio at that age. I mean, it was, yeah, it, it, his performance was unbelievable. So I wonder if they, were, they would have done that with, I, I don't know if he was offered the role or he had to, 
um, auditioned for that? Was, was, was there other bigger, I mean, I know he wasn't a big name yet. Um, I mean, he had been around for a little while, but from child acting and all that, but um, is that something where they probably offered him the role and then he, and then they're like, here's the guy. And then they went from there. Is, is it, do you happen to know that? I, I mean, it seems that way. I think he's, I'm not sure anybody else could have nailed it like that. You know, I mean, cause if right before that, if you've ever seen it, he did this boy's life with yeah. De Niro. Mm -hmm. Yes. Shut your pie hole kid. Like that yeah. was, that was, was like frighteningly good too. So and, good. Yeah, those early DiCaprio movies, you just knew that he just had a talent that... Yeah, so he probably did The Basketball Diaries before eating Gilbert Grape then, right? I think no, after. That was after. Oh, it was after. Okay. It, it was, was after. after, yeah. He was more... He was like Gilbert Grape, from what I remember, was like that movie that everybody's like, who in the hell is that guy? That was right. one of the... You yeah. know? And then but, he was kind of known when he did The Basketball Diaries. But uh, but this boy's life, if, if you... if. Anybody hasn't seen that movie as well? Of course, if you haven't seen Eating Game, we're great. You got to see that. But yeah, his life is another one, man. He is fun. He and De Niro, uh, they're phenomenal. They're both phenomenal in it. De Niro, I hated him. I hated De Niro in that movie. Yeah, yeah. I, De Niro is because I could not stand him, and I love that guy. Always loved him in it. But that shows that was you know his how what a powerhouse he is as well. You know so. So, so you know, working in film, like it's one thing that strikes me interesting about your story is you mentioned your your mentor. What's his name again? Uh, Alan Blomquist. And so, you know, he's got a crazy. He did all, like a lot of the Lassa Hallstrom films, Shock a Lot. Um, what's the the cooking one? The Mile, whatever that was. I mean, it's ridiculous what he's done. Wait, and. What's that? Ahead, honey. The Green Mile? Uh, the, no. No, it's the. It was. Uh, it was. God, it was like a French cooking movie kind of a thing. Oh, I see. Oh, see. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, okay. I think I. I can't also did House Rules. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And he was brought into Parallel Entertainment. He had this really great high production value, slick film kind of thing. Like he did Gilbert Grape, he did Of Mice and Men. And then suddenly he's doing like Larry the Cable Guy Health Inspector and he's doing you know, <laughs> <laughs> really kind of higher brow entertainment. And um, <laughs> that, that's kind of why they brought him in. They they knew they wanted to make movies with uh, Larry Dan and and they um, you know brought in a, a real filmmaker to kind of helm that stuff. Well, Johnny and I talk about this, about this industry, like like how one person can make your career, literally, whether it be a casting director, a producer. Yeah. It's like that one person that believes in you can just lead you from project to project to project, which I think is, is fascinating. So I think for a lot of aspiring artists, you know, in this industry who are listening, you know, you don't have to get everybody to like you. You don't have to get everybody to be a fan. You know, if you can just find that one person you know, they can take you to places that you you, you know you never thought you can go. I had a friend who this casting director fell in love with her, and almost every project this casting director did, she found herself in in this project. You know, and I think that's dope that you found somebody like that early on to mentor you. Where where'd you come from, Higgs? Where where, where were you born and raised? Uh, born in Boston, raised in San Diego. Oh wow! So kind of like polar <laughs> opposites there. Uh, now, how, long, how long? In, I'm sorry, Rube, but how long okay. in Boston before you moved? You guys moved. Were you a little kid, or were, did you experience a little bit of Boston? I was five, and we actually moved to Fullerton, Orange County, and I had this like crazy ass fucking Southie accent in first grade. I mean, I was like right out of fucking The Departed or something. The Departed, <laughs> and um, they put me in speech class and like scrubbed my fucking accent completely. No way. I should sue the Orange County School District for cultural deprivation. <laughs> <laughs> I could have talked like Matt Damon. I could have been a, I could so, have been a wall bag. Did you, did you go to, so when you were, so you grew up in San Diego, so you went to high school and everything there. Like, did you study film or directing or anything like that? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I went to high school, interestingly enough, at Claremont High School, and 
in my 10th grade public speaking class, there's a guy sitting in the corner taking notes and didn't think anything of it at the time, but that was Cameron Crowe and he was basically writing Fast Times at Ridgemont High right. based on shit he was hearing from kids doing public speeches about getting fucked up at Rolling Stones concerts and, you know, you know, yeah. So Spicoli was a composite of people I knew. Um, I used to like jam out with a guy who was like Andy Rathbone, who was the rat from like, the kid that worked in the movie theater. Yeah. Um, so there was all that. And then eventually I found my way into UCSD and I studied film and it was more like the visual arts department. It was kind of like art films and real sophisticated stuff. And, from there, from there, kind of uh, moved forward. forward, but there was already kind of education and multi-camera, you know, events or anything that I kind of evolved into. So, what did what did your parents? Were your parents supportive? Actually, yeah, they were happy that I, you know, did anything at that point. They were just get out of here, kid. Go earn a living. <laughs> um, yeah. So when did you come to Los Angeles? Uh, 1990. Like, right like along the way, I was a music journalist for Tower Records. I wrote for Tower Records, also for a magazine called Rockbeat, which was the sister magazine to Rip Magazine. It was like the heavy metal era. I hung out with a lot of musicians in San Diego. A lot of them were getting success in Los Angeles at the time. So after college, I kind of moved to LA to kind of be around the music scene and when it imploded with Nirvana in like 92 I ended up transitioning and it sounds like I came to LA to work in film and now I'm going to stop sitting around and work in film Wow, looks like Johnny's frozen yeah. Johnny? Yeah, it's you warned me about a shitty internet. Johnny, Johnny's frozen. Johnny, come back to us, son. Walk to the light. Me, oh, I, really? mean, I, I will say, really? I mean, the pandemic has been an, yeah. an issue, man, but I, internet issues that um, we have to deal my, with. And not just here, Johnny was just telling me on The Voice last night, uh, Blake totally went out. On the voice, so uh, we apologize for the technical difficulties, guys. But something just out of our um, control, unfortunately. Yeah, Johnny's still frozen. He's glitchy. Yeah, my internet has gotten really shitty. I don't know if my neighbors are all like figured out my password or what the fucking deal is, but um, yeah. it's all you know, kind of janked up here too. So. So you told us about your mentor, how he, you know, kind of led you to parallel entertainment. How was it work? Now, when you started working with uh, blue collar guys, you know, how was how was that for you? How were those guys to work with? They were great. You know, I mean, it was. I mean, Alan brought me in, and at the time, Alan direct Alan directed Ralphie May. He directed Henry Cho, and he directed Russell's first special. So. You know, um, part of it was he's in the Directors Guild as a production manager. And I think after so many whacks at um, being a director, he needed to kind of step out of that. Otherwise, he was going to, you know, earn the wrath of the, the DGA. But, I mean, I love the blue collar guys. I mean, I really worked. It was kind of, it was really Dan, Larry, Dan, a.k.a. Larry, and Bill, and I kind of got to know Jeff a little bit, but really Engball, who I directed that, um, his special, and uh, Cable Guy, we did some Christmas specials together. As a, I did that as a producer, and it was it was a crazy environment because, you know, it was a management company, and management company, production company, and, uh, and, uh, just to watch that whole side of the business was fascinating for me. Fascinating for me. Fascinating for me. I'm causing problems. You back, Johnny? I don't know. Am I? Yeah. Yeah. Here you now. Okay, we're good now. Yeah. Right. Weird. So I hope I didn't mess uh, Dave up because when I 
Oh, uh, no. He's a lot of, I don't know if that was from. You, Johnny? Okay, you look like you're back yeah. now. Now we lost him. Now we lost him. <laughs> we'll All right. it then. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure he'll 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 check back in. Um so here's 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 the thing that uh that I'm most not most curious about. One of the things that I'm curious about when when you first started directing these specials, you know, not all directors cut their specials, correct? Like a lot of them will shoot the footage and then send it off to an to an editor. Now, is that is that something that you, when you're shooting a special you like to um, be involved in the editing process? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've always been kind of a gearhead and very technical, uh, I've, whether camera operating or just the technology of television and film production has always kind of excited me. So I've been a bit of a gearhead and from sitting in edit bays and watching other editors do their thing, I kind of absorbed that and got to a place where I could edit some of the specials. Um, good friend of mine, Tommy Asakawa, edited a lot of the comedy specials that we did. And then uh, he and I did some of the Russell ones. And more recently, I've edited Russell's last two specials. And, you know, I just enjoy the process. And how do you feel about, because I, I have friends who, who are editors, how do you feel about the artists being involved in the editing process with you? Oh, hate that! I mean, just, you know, I just <laughs> never let an artist never let an artist into the edit bay. It's just it's a, you know, the cut. They can give you notes, but never let them fucking sit there because <laughs> uh, Johnny will enjoy this. I, I'll repeat the question for Johnny. Okay. Johnny, I, um, I was talking to Dave about the fact that not only he directs, he's, he's starting to edit a lot of the specials that he shoots. Yeah. And I asked him, how does he feel about the artist being involved in the <laughs> editing process with him? And Dave, repeat your answer to Johnny. Never let an artist in the edit bay. Just, <laughs> no. <laughs> Cause Dave, let me tell you something. If you directed Johnny Sanchez's special, he would hound you to be involved in that editing process to be well, here, man. I'm, I'm actually glad Ruben brought this up because this was something I was going to ask earlier, and I, 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 we got we jumped on something else, but, um, but a lot of times, Ruben, did you explain too? Sometimes our bits that you know they have a beginning and an end or a beginning and a middle and an end, actually beginning, middle and end as well. There's some parts in the middle that need to be there. Sometimes they get, they get chopped up and taken out. And, you know, for us, we're just like, no, the, the, you know, it's a five minute bit. It needs to be the five minutes. And sometimes they end up at three or three and a half. And, and we're kind of like, there was, there was purpose on that word, even though there wasn't a big laugh or there was purpose on that. So, um, <laughs> So that happens to us sometimes, but I can only imagine how hard that must be to have a, a, the artist in there. Probably, did, do you do they typically want everything left in? Is that the problem? Well, I mean, the process for me is I get I do a full string out. There's no edits. There's no pull ups. You kind of get a feel for what the whole set is, sure. and it's you know it's a collaborative effort to say what stays in. And, you know, I work closely with a lot of managers. And so the managers may have a stronger opinion about that. Mm -hmm. They have a better knowledge of what the artist wants and is looking for. Um, like somebody like Russell doesn't want to see himself. He doesn't want to hear himself. Mm -hmm. He it's just, yeah. yeah, he just like, I don't care. It's like, hey, Russell, do you like that? I don't know. I didn't even look at it, you know, but it's, <laughs> that's how he is. But, but um, Russell. <laughs> But Rube, we, we just we got something that we did. We, Ruben and I wasn't. We we did a taping, and uh, I know it's taken us a while to go through it. Uh, initially, we went through it, but we're supposed to try to pick the clips we want. Um, and I got there was something else I shot last year, and man, I got I got Dave. I got five minutes in. I just could not watch myself anymore. Yeah. You know, I sound like that. Do I? You know. Yeah. I almost I feel like my chin. Comics, I got five chins. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like comics are probably better off 
which I know Rube started doing. He was getting better with this. I don't know about video. I know he was audio taping himself every set, but I think it's good for comics to just videotape their video, their sets when they go do, when we get back to all this, because you do, you do get used to being able to watch yourself and your mannerisms and what you're doing and what you shouldn't be doing. That's great preparation for, you know? Yeah. I mean, I will I say was, that. I, yeah. I was gonna, I'm sorry, Dave. And this kind of piggybacks on Johnny's thing is for, for me, as long as I feel like the editor cares about me and wants the best for me, which the editor should want, I, I just don't want to be involved in that process as much unless there's a specific bits. Like after I see a rough cut of it, I might go, hey, man, and discuss like a line that should be put, put in or discuss why that was cut out. But I just... I overthink everything, and that's one of my issues. And Johnny has the same issues. If he doesn't mind me, you know, saying yeah. that we both discussed yeah. it. And, and at some point, at an artist, man, you got to get out of your own way. And it's it's taken me a long time to get to that point. And I guess because you know I've been burned early in 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 my career, you know, with with edits of things where people taking out jokes and you know, just bad cuts. So I think that kind of makes you like, man, why did they do this? Why did they take this out? But now, as long as it's somebody that I know has my best interest in heart, it's like, do your thing, man. And then if I have an issue that I'm really passionate about, then I'll bring that up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't editorialize content. I mean, I, I'm i not the one who sits there and say, this is funny, let's put that in or let's take this out. I never, ever, you know, on my own say, oh, let's fucking take that out. I mean, it's, I respect the the art of the comic. And I mean, my general note to any comic when we do a special, cause there's always so much gravitas around the filming of a special and they get a little wound up and it's a, it's a big moment. And there's obviously a lot on the line, but I would say, give me this performance that you would do if we didn't have cameras here. Just if whatever night, if it's Russell in Sydney, Russell in London, Lisa in, Santa Rosa, just give us the fucking show. Pretend we're not even here. I mean, I look at it as a documentary. We're kind of documenting a comedy performance. A, a, mm. You know, it's a slice of somebody's career at that moment in time. Mm. And that's what Ralphie May was doing in 2006. That's what Russell was doing in 2020. You know, I mean, yeah. so I, I respect that whole part of it. And I just try and capture the you know, performance as best I can and really kind of create that special, you know? And yeah. So, so b before you actually go in to, to shoot uh, a, an artist, how many times do you like to uh, see the set before you feel like, okay, I, I got this to capture, I know how I'm, I want to shoot this. How many times do you like to see the set? Or does that even matter to you? doesn't necessarily matter. I mean, I want to be familiar with it. Um, you know, I'd like to see the set at least once, but if I'm really looking for, are there big gestures and mannerisms? Is there some crazy tumbling act that he's going to fall over the stage? I mean, do you want to know when these moments yeah. come up that you're going to have the coverage that at this point he goes to the audience at this point, Lisa does something crazy. I mean, do you want to kind of, have a sense of what's coming at you um, for audio as well. Sometimes people are very quiet and then suddenly they're screaming. So you need to give the audio guy a ride the fader on this because she's going to scream. And, you know, technically yeah. little things like that. Yeah, that's a Ruben Paul thing right there. Um, when Ruben's. Uh oh. When Ruben, when Ruben starts laughing or something on stage, or he'll, he'll, he'll go, what? He'll like, the mic stays. <laughs> Right there. <laughs> Even up in the club or like this. Um, I got to tell you a really uh, interesting story about um, with Lisa Lampanelli. I was working with her. Um, man, I'm, I'm trying to figure out when this was, but somewhere between 06 and 2010 maybe or something. Okay. You know? Somewhere around there. But anyway, we were working at the improv. It was either Irvine or Brea. And she was headlined. So this, this was for the back. This is more like 05, 06 or 07, somewhere around there. And because I hadn't done Matt TV, that's for sure. Uh, and uh, I was doing the week there with her and I was featuring and we got along great. 
And it was backstage that I noticed that she was a, a big fan of Hello Kitty, right? <laughs> Which I just thought was the funniest thing because from her style and her stand-up, the Queen of Mean, and she's just ripping people new assholes. And and I said to her, I go, you know, I go, this is really funny that you love you're a fan of Hello Kitty. You have Hello Kitty everywhere. You know? And I remember I said, and I'm not saying this because of, of like, hey, she got to give credit, whatever. I said, um, you should come up with like your own version, your your mean version of that. And she literally, I mean, she didn't even think long. She just went, oh, you mean like Hello Cunty? <laughs> <laughs> that's where she, she, that was the moment she goes, ooh, I think she made t-shirts or some whatever. But she came up and she goes, and I'll spell it with a K. I'm going to spell it with a K though. And it's going to look just like, you know, and she ended up coming up with uh, her Hello, uh, Hello Cunty. <laughs> it was perfect because it was it was part of who she really was you know what i mean like she loved hello kitty but it was also her you know queen of mean thing that she uh was so good we had a great week together because you know what's funny i would at that time can't remember the material i was doing but um i would get off so she would go up and she'd go all right give it up for the little mexican who read a book <laughs> I would have stuff on history of Mexicans and we did this and we didn't do that. It was all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I just wiped it out with just one statement when you went up there. Give it up for the little Mexican that read a book, you know. So funny. So funny. I, mean, I was always impressed with how sensitive she actually was. I remember like she would be hurt if she offended somebody actually. Right. Like, Lisa, Lisa, do you hear what comes out of your fucking mouth? Like <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, uh, you know one one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is obviously the technical stuff, how you shoot comedy, how you view it, but then you have another layer of the sensitivity of an artist because doing a special is a very personal thing, you know, for an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, so you do see those moments of insecurity, and fear that the audience and probably sometimes your peers might not not even see. You know, because there is that moment and I get privy to, uh, to that a little bit, too, because I'm working hand in hand with the artist where you go, damn, dude, you've done these jokes a thousand times. Why are you so yeah. terrified yeah. to do it right now? Just go do it what you do. And one thing that I love about you, Higgs, and I'm sure, uh, you know, this is probably with most directors who directs comedy specials is to put the artist at ease. You mm -hmm. go, hey, man, you're great. You got this. You're doing the special for a reason. You're more than ready to do this. Just like you said earlier, just act like we're not there. We're just documenting this whole thing for you, man. You're already great. You don't have to do anything extra or special. I mean, I try. And, and quite frankly, I'm just as scared as they are. I mean, when we filmed in India, I was fucking scared shitless. I mean, there's <laughs> so much that could have gone wrong there. It was all riding on me. And it's like, we came all this fucking way. And... Who the fuck knows what's gonna happen here? There's some guy in flip flops up in the fucking grid somewhere, like <laughs> literally. But you know, uh, when you did India, like I had never gotten that many emails from you before then, and I remember I told you, you were like, <laughs> "When did you get to India?" I'm like, "Dave, I'm not going to India." You're like, "What?" <laughs> yeah. I said, "Well, I'll make sure I, I get everything that you <laughs> that you <laughs> that you need." Um, to do this, but but you talk about that experience of shooting in India. I kind of want to double back to what we're talking about. Like you, you're you're talking about the reverse jib shot, mm -hmm. and you know seeing some of these beautiful venues that you've shot in, and then you shooting in arenas. As a director, what do you prefer? Do you prefer shooting in like the smaller theaters or the arenas? Like, what is that headache for you, or what is that anxiety level for you? I mean, I guess they all come with a similar anxiety level because of just the technicality of it all. But I mean, I've shot in like the punchline in Atlanta, which was a freaking shoebox, you know, and then I've shot in the O2 arena, which was 13,000 seats, you know, and it's technically it's just a bigger animal. I mean, your your cable runs, your lenses, it's, you know, everything is bigger and longer and more to set up and... Is, is your main concern in an arena show, is it sound? Is that one of your main concerns? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, it's it's everything. You want to capture the sound. You you need to mic the audience a certain way and capture it. Um, oh, my God. You, you're generally using 
big sports lenses. I mean, your 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 lenses are about ninety feet back. It seems to be about the the standard distance of where you want that. You know, so you've got to make sure your depth of field goes falls off at ninety feet if you're on a long lens. So you know, if the comic is kind of coming forward and backwards, like operators sitting there trying to ride the focus as mm. things are happening, and it's there's just so many things technically going on that it's you know a lot to uh when you talk about miking the audience that drives me crazy when i'm watching you know a production and the audience isn't mic correctly another conversation me and johnny have had that can take away so much from an artist's performance because if he's killing and of course, like we said, the material should be able to stand alone, but let's be honest, you know, people at home are influenced by what they hear coming through the television. So if you're killing and the audience is not mic properly, uh, that's, that's infuriating. And, uh, you know, I won't call anybody out, but I remember doing something <laughs> and they documented it and then they used the footage and the audience isn't mic'd. So I'm up there and you're watching it and it you know it sounds like you're you're dying on stage and it's like no I'm killing on stage but but when you're watching it you can't tell and that that's I I can't stand that and that probably gets back again to the insecurity of artists wanting to be involved in the editing process man it's shit like that that happens well I mean and they know what bits worked that night, you know, the big, oh, I killed it. Why isn't there a bigger laugh there? What happened? Especially in editorial, you have kind of like scratch mixes and stuff that are in there. And like, I thought I did better than that or whatever. And yeah, it's, <laughs> they definitely take that personally. It's like, man, you know, oh, or, yeah. or take that out. Cause that bit, I didn't get a laugh there. Why didn't I get a laugh there? Cut that out. And that's actually going back to you, Johnny. That's what will drive you know, the editorial for the artists. Like, cut that out. It wasn't funny. They didn't laugh. It didn't hit the way I wanted it to hit. And Yeah, yeah. One time I ended up with, this was a, uh, you know, one of those specials that had uh, about six or seven comics on it. And uh, <laughs> uh, there was so much uh, slicing and editing going on, obviously, and even probably ramping up the laughs. Because on the opposite end of that, sometimes you'll go, wow, I don't remember the crowd exploding like that when I delivered that. But one of the funnier things, there was one of the comics who, uh, during his set, he got a partial standing O. Some people in the front started standing up for him. And we were like, man, good for you, dude. Well, that ended up in my set. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I would tell the fellow comics that would say, hey, man, you had a great set. I go, that wasn't even mine. Like, I would, I'm not going to claim that. You know what I mean? I'm like, that was not mine. They did not do that for me. You know what I mean? So... Uh, sometimes somebody's trying to juice it up and it can be something that, you know, we don't want, you know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. well, it's interesting to hear Johnny say that. And then you can respond, uh, Dave, because I don't think you're somebody who do that. And if you did, you probably were told to do that by a producer, but uh, I take, yeah. Yeah. Our manager. <laughs> <I take the show. laughs> yeah. Manager. <laughs> I, I, take, I, I take the show years ago. I was very excited about this taping and uh, they messed with my edit. Um, I found out later that it was done purposely. And um, I, it, to the point where I had friends in the front row that called me and they go, hey, did you record two shows? And I said, why? <laughs> and they said, because when we watched it, we weren't in the front row. So they would do audience cuts and it wasn't even my fucking audience that yeah, they were man. cutting. From. Right. And uh, I got a standing ovation that show on television and it did not make the edit. Now I found mm -hmm. out I wasn't a part of the, the in group and I wasn't managed by the people who are in charge by the production. But those are the things again, Dave, like that lead artists as we get more power, as we become more popular or whatever it was like, I just don't want that to happen again. But going back to my, my new mindset is that's why it's very vital to me to have an editor that wants my best interests. Once I feel that, then I can let it go. Have you ever been involved in situations where people wanted to purposely screw artists? Not, not in that way, no. I mean, <laughs> otherwise, yeah, fuck the artists. But, um, <laughs> not 
<laughs> but I mean, going back to that, when we shot Lampanelli's HBO special, HBO had this rule that all the audience shots had to be in the moment. Like if somebody's laughing at the Asian joke or the gay joke or the black joke, that had to be at that moment in time. You couldn't just cheat a reaction from some other part of the show, you know? And that, that's the only time I've ever faced that. The only network I've ever seen that said, if, if somebody's laughing at this material, it has to be right. at that moment in time from that part of the cut. So you can't just kind of fluff your edit up with reaction shots because, you know, and especially with somebody like Lisa, cause she was just fierce at that time. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think for, sensitivity issues and whatever, they wanted to make sure that, you know, if, if somebody was laughing at a joke, they were laughing at that specific joke and we weren't just kind of like cheating it for, you know, visuals. Mm. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Now, do you, has there ever been a time where someone has shot a special and it just didn't work and now you got to do this magic in, in editing. You don't have to say an artist, but just a situation like, shit, this isn't very good. How can we make this? How can I make everybody happy here? Uh, no, and I've not had that problem. I mean, I think fortunately, as I got into this game, I was brought into a certain level of talent, you know? Um, and people generally had their shit together. I mean, the, the comics were of a certain caliber that they were just good mm -hmm. and their audiences love them. And to that extent, most of the shows we did, especially with the, the parallel entertainment artists and with Russell too, those are fans. Those are people that bought tickets to shows. It's not like some Comedy Paper. Central strip show where mm -hmm. they bust in a bunch of people that are just bodies and chairs. These are people that paid 75, 100, 150 bucks, whatever it was to sit in these seats. And they're there for a good time. They're fans and you know they're gonna bring it. Those are the yep. best audiences you can have in a TV special, not your canned, you know, bust in general yeah. audience kind of thing. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, I, I always say that, you know, when you get to that level, it's always a home game. You know, you're playing in front of your fans, you know, and when you're on the rise as an artist, a lot of times, you know, it can be an away game <laughs> when you're shooting. Yeah. You know, because people don't know who you are and they are bringing in a paid audience or, you know, gave, you know, gave away free tickets or, or whatever it is. And that's a little bit of a different ball game. And I, I just think the goal, you know, I think of any artist is to get to the point where their fans are in a building who already like them, who already appreciate them. And they <laughs> have that added energy in there. So, yeah, I mean, that drives the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm like... <laughs> As as Rubens, as you guys are talking about both these styles of, of fans and then bust in, uh, Ruben, you did this taping too. But we'll we'll talk. Uh, we can even tell Dave afterwards. But I don't want to bring it up. It never aired, by the way. But uh, they they brought in these audiences. And we're all they were doing. I think four four or five comics per episode or whatever. And the the audience was so hot that they were told to laugh as much as they could. <laughs> I don't know if you remember what I'm talking about, Ruben, but they were laughing so much, Dave, and so hard and for so long that they were throwing the comics. The the timing was off. Awful. They were they were they were laughing at the setups. They were laughing at anything the comics had been doing. And I remember specifically the first guy. We're just like, holy crap! So and so is destroying. And then they he he got off stage and he kept walking. And he's like. He was like, dude, they throw me, that threw me off, dude. They, they, they got to pull him back. And after the <laughs> second or third comment, they go, okay, guys, listen, you don't have to laugh and applaud and, and like, keep laughing that much. <laughs> anyway, well, well, you can let Dave know about it. Ask Renee it. about ask Renee about the Cabo Comedy Festival when we shot down there at Cabo Wabo, and we had to film during the day because the comedy festival was happening at night. And uh, the stand up and deliver? Yeah, stand up and deliver. And yeah, okay. so we were getting our audience like off the cruise ships and it was, we were offering them like air conditioning and free beer to kind of come sit and be at, at a taping. And here's a bucket of beer and some 72 degrees and yeah. laugh. People have no idea what, what comedians go through, man. They just see the, the end product of what was 
was shot. And uh, uh yeah, you ask Renee, Renee, you mean Renee Garcia? No, our uh, Renee. Gary. Renee Aguirre, your boy. Oh, Renee! Yes, yes. I'm sorry. There's a the comedian, Renee Garcia, would not have surprised me if he had done the taping. Is what? Well. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Rene yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. We definitely got. He was, he was a fuse at the time, and we did like ten episodes at the Improv on Melrose, and then we went down to Cabo and did like another yeah. season. We were like blasted out a season I, in three days. I remember all that. Yes, I remember when all that was going on. Absolutely, Johnny. Did right. you did you ever tape Stand and Deliver or no? No, I was supposed to do one of the, it was the one of the ones in Cabo, and I think it was the first one, but this was when I, which was 20, this was either, this was somewhere around 2013. Does it sound about right? That was um, the first one. Yep. So I was actually, this, uh, Ruben, this was when I was living in Columbia, South Carolina, mm. and they were trying to get my flight arrangement and whatever, and I, this was the very, very first one. Um, and something happened. I just remember the day before I went to check in and there was, my, there was no, I had no flight. And then I called and they were trying to like fix things and, and it just, something happened. There was just a mix up in the, in the, tra and the travel and flight. And I, I got nervous with having a flight back. So it, it, it didn't, it didn't go through. And they were like, we'll just bring you back next year. And then what happened? Cause you guys did. Probably three, right? There was three, three different years. We did. I I was on the Melrose Improv ones. I was on the first Cabo Festival. We were set to go to the second Cabo Festival. I had my like ticket in hand, my oh. reservations, and that Hurricane O'Deal came in and just yeah. decimated that's Cabo. And that's right. And that was it. Back. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's what. I, yeah. So so Dave, um, you, we're getting ready to to wrap up here, man. All right. Uh, your journey is, is uh yeah. It, but wait, it, it, oh wait, I have a question though. Okay. Go, go I'm ahead. curious, uh, out of you know all these specials that you've been a part of the and and directed and everything and edited and is there a um, is there a certain special for you that is your favorite and it's your favorite not just because of content from the comedian but how it was shot. Is there one in particular or uh, that stands out to you that? You go, man, I love the way this special was done. Not only do I love the comic, but I love the way this was presented. Don't worry, I won't tell Russell. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about for him. I, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I'm no, 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 not his specials. I'm talking about uh, other specials. Oh. Uh, from prior to Robin Williams at the Met or what, you know, uh, that's what I mean. Not, oh, not okay. that's special. Did, Something that he looks back on and goes, man, you know, this was when, when you know, maybe Sunset Strip or, you know, maybe it was Carlin's blah, blah, blah. You know, is there something that you inspired you? Is that you always go, I love this special or, you know, I'm sure there could be numerous ones, but. I mean, I love the old <laughs> classics like that, the Carlin's and the, yeah. like the prior and stuff, because yeah. those were, first of all, all those were shot on film, which shooting multi-camera on film is like a whole nother animal that we never even kind of burrowed into here. Um, but those are the classics, you know? And then Marty Callender, I'm a huge fan of his, and I see the work that he, you know, he's, he does music and comedy and does some amazing work. And I've been in, you know, up for jobs against him. And sometimes I got him and sometimes I didn't. It was always just to be in the same conversation as Marty Callender. It was always like, Blew wow. me away like that, but I mean, I just I do love the old classics, you know, yeah. and yeah, because those were real. That was yeah. yeah. I think Ruben and I agree. I think our favorite is prior, Live at Long Beach, right? With Pryor, yeah. yeah. That I love that special for a lot of reasons. It it was um, number one, it was my favorite uh, album that that he that he did uh, yeah. that that particular that that material, mm -hmm. and just I just remember him representing referencing Patti LaBelle yeah. and during that time having a cutaway to the audience was like whoa because there are some issues of people seating or something yeah. he made it so real. Yeah. Yes. yeah so like whoa <laughs> and um I don't know I just love that special and then to even think back now as an adult to think how big Richard must have been to have Patti LaBelle open up for him on a comedy special is just insane to me. So that's one of my favorite ones. And I also loved uh, Robin Williams live at the Met. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was, 
yeah. that was that special. I thought was was really good. I just re remember that standing out to me. But um, you know, before we let you go, you, you had meant, uh, made mention of when you submitted a, uh, Thanks, a yeah. to, to William Morris with all these wonderful specials that you've done over the year, and they're like, "Is there anything else you got?" And you're like, uh, "So, <laughs> so for you, uh, I know." Um, uh, we talked about in who knows uh, uh, collaborating on maybe a, a cartoon that that I think is still in the mix from what what Tony uh, told me. Are you still is 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 there? I mean, especially during this quarantine, your mind must be racing of things to do. Have you ever just thought Higby? Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever painting the wall? <laughs> I mean, Higgs, uh, uh, do, do you write at all? I never even asked you. Do you do you write? Is that something? It just seems like you'd be you'd well, be you great. Remember Shapiro, right? Who did Russell's the animation yes. animated open for um, Almost Famous? Shapiro yeah. and I have been collaborating. We've got that kind of uh, that one, the cartoon, that, right? That cartoon that we've been trying to get some legs under, and he's actually getting some heat on a couple of his other projects. Um, trying to work with him on some of those. And especially now, I mean, live action is DOA, whether you're on a sound stage or in a venue. So mm -hmm. animation is one of the few things right now that you can kind of yeah. actually yeah. still do. And so yeah. we're, we're pushing, he's got a manager that's trying to rep him and, and, you know, get some of that stuff going. We've been writing and collaborating on some things and hopefully, you know, Hopefully that'll bridge me till we can get back to the live stuff because I want to get that back out in the world, man. I, you know. Yeah, I know, man. Do. I know, and I'm I'm looking forward to hopefully uh, working with you soon, man. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah man. I, but you know, Rube, I always like I always got to throw a pitch out there. So now I was initially thinking this should be you know live action, but if there's got to be an animation version, and it's a reboot. Of um of mice and man, but it would be myself and Felipe Esparza. You know Felipe, right? <laughs> you know Felipe is. So it would, but it's uh, it's titled uh, of of mice and menudo. <laughs> hey, I, don't like hey, see? So, you don't like it. Hey, see, you got to get the ten de canejos. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been our. Uh, great pleasure to have our guest Dave Higby. Uh, Thanks, you know, go through, look at some of these Ralphie May specials, Lisa Lampanelli specials, Billy Gardell's the blue collar guys. Steve He's Trevino's on there, right? You did, you did work yeah, with Steve. Yeah, everybody's represented. I got all the, 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 the Benetton ad. Yeah, uh, Russell, Russell Peters special is is on Amazon currently right now. And uh, Dave, just thank you for taking the time out and 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 doing this. I hope people. Will, we're able to learn a little I bit did. of what goes right. on. I learned something. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it again. If you didn't get it this time, we'll pick it up some other time. And, uh, I would love to do it at some point where we could actually be in the studio. I hope a lot wasn't lost with our technical issues, yeah. but yeah. as everybody knows, I mean, it's what we all have to deal with. Like, like I was saying, Johnny, when you were gone, I was yeah. telling them what happened on the, vo the voice. Yeah, heard, yeah, right, right. Tell them what happened on the voice. I didn't see it. Oh yeah, he was doing. It was down to the three artists, and this and and you know Blake gently had two of his artists in the that were in the top three. So mm -hmm. now he's got to give his last speech, his last thing to both of them, and he's at home, and Gwen Stefani's behind him, and all their kids, the mix, the the the, the mixed family together, and he starts to roll, man, with like. Let me start with so-and-so. He's going on. And it was the most awkward moment, dude, because the artists are just sitting there and you can see them. They're making this face like, you can't hear him. He's going in and out. And it was bad, dude. It was like he had almost no sound at all. And he went on. For, I, I, in a weird way, I was waiting for Carson Daly to interrupt him going, hold on. Maybe you need to check him out. But he didn't. He just let him go, dude. It was like a two-minute long thing on both of them. Nobody heard a word. And they all just sat there like this, the artist. <laughs> so, and then, it, 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 Johnny's making a face of just the most oh, awkward, uncomfortable. Awkward. Like, what do they do? But then it was weird. It was like uh, he finished, and then Carson goes, "Hey, sorry, we had a your mic. I don't know if something's on. You could see Blake looking around. 
And then they went to uh, uh, the Jonas, um, uh, which Jonas Brothers on there? Um, jo is it Joe? No. I get those guys all mixed up. But they went to the Jonas guy, and then his mic was fine. He was fine, and then he gave his last speech to his guy, and it was crystal clear, you know? So yeah. might have so been because Mike was in Oklahoma. I don't know. As yeah, somebody well, said recently, it's like if this COVID thing has taught us anything, it's like which celebrities have shitty internet. You know, it's yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> what they don't realize sometimes it's just it's just the internet, man. It's it's not a, a a perfect thing, but so our apologies for any technical glitches. But it's the world we're living in right now. And once again, thank you, Dave, for for joining us, joining us. Thanks here for on, having me on, on this Go episode. Ahead, man. So great! I'm glad I got a chance to meet you as well, and and thank uh, and thank everybody that watched and Stan Felton still every every single episode he's watched. Thank you, man. Whisper out to him and yeah, uh, thank you, man, everybody who's uh, yeah. who been and watched. And uh, lot, there were a lot of comics on here, man. I think they wanted to hear what Dave had to say. Oh no shit! Yeah, you know? yeah. That's why I thought it would be great to have yeah. Dave on there because he just gives another perspective. Because there's a lot of you know, people out there who haven't shot TV yet, let alone shot their own special. So it was great to have Dave give a little bit of, of, of insight. And great. Dave, and I'm, I'm glad to any of you comics out there when we come back, you know. And, and, Dave, and thank you. I'll kind of deal with you directly. So. Yeah, and thank you for never screwing a comic on the edit on purpose. I, 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 <laughs> oh. I that. Thank you guys for listening. That's the best of everything with Ruben Paul and Johnny Sanchez and our special guest, Dave Higby. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, YouTube, uh, anywhere you can find podcasts, you'll be able to uh, to find us. So tell a friend. Paul Dees. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dees has been listening. Paul Dees is another very funny comic, Dave. Uh, that when this pandemic is over, you have to check out. Yeah. Uh, but but thank you guys. So tell a friend, share the podcast. You know, if you go to iTunes and leave a great comment, all that helps uh, get us out there even more. So thank you guys for listening to the best of everything with Ruben Paul and Johnny Sanchez, and we are out. Ruby Mother and Tuesdays. This show is all about diversity and bringing everyone together. See you at Ruby Tuesday.